Welcome to Free Thought Matters. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor, a co-founder of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces this weekly TV programming for the rest of us, the 26% of Americans today who identify as non-religious. We'd love to have you join the foundation, which is the largest association of free thinkers in North America, and free thinkers means atheists, agnostics, and humanists. FFRF works to keep religion out of government, just like our founders intended. Sign up today or ask for more information at FFRF.org. I'm here in our Stephen Yule Friendly Atheist Studio with two of my heroes. Uh, we have two distinguished scholars who have peerlessly documented the roots of America's secular constitution. Isaac Kramnik is the Richard J. Swartz Professor of Government Emeritus at Cornell, where he's taught since 1972. Larry Moore is the Howard A. Newman Professor of History and American Studies Emeritus at Cornell University, and they co-authored the classic book, The Godless Constitution, The Case Against Religious Correctness, in the, and this came out in the late 1990s, and just last year they followed it up with Godless Citizens in a Godly Republic, Atheists in Public Life. This book documents the treatment of atheists in the United States and the new atheist awakening. So welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Very Thank nice you to for be having you. Very nice to have you here. Now, I wonder if even after all these years, the title of your first book, The Godless Constitution, might create some gasps because many people do not realize that our Constitution has no God in it. Uh, how did you get together and what prompted you to write that book? Well, it was it, it, it was a, a product of an accident. Um, it was 1994 or five, I've forgotten exactly which year. Uh, Bill Clinton was flying across the country in Air Force One and he had his the radio on and he was listening to a Christian radio call-in show uh, that was uh, being very critical of him and he called back he called the phone, uh, the uh, radio station, uh, to make his response, and this got a lot of press. And this prompted me to write an op-ed piece for the Times uh, about Jefferson and Jefferson. And in the talk show, Clinton had been criticized as uh, as a non-believer and as a critic of religion. It prompted me to write this piece and send it to the Times about Jefferson in the election of 1800, when he had been criticized strongly by Adams uh, for being an infidel. And uh, I concluded the little piece with the quote from Jefferson mem uh, Memorial on the, on the base of the rotunda, upon the, uh, upon the altar of God I have sworn eternal hostility to all forms of tyranny over the minds of men. And I pointed out that most people think that that uh, was about George III, and uh, since the building was put up in the 1940s, that it was about Hitler, et cetera. And then I ended the piece with pointing out that, no, it was about the clergy of Philadelphia. And it's the, been the most misquoted, uh, misunderstood quote in American history. Well, what then happened was that the Times wrote back to me and said that they had an unbelievable number of letters from this piece, many more than is usual, and would I like to see them? And they sent them to me, and they were from uh, people on school boards, uh, gay activists who who were just so thrilled to have this indication that the uh, founding fathers were uh, critical of the clergy. So. Larry, uh, I'm just a political philosopher professor, and Larry is a historian of religion, American religion. So I said, Larry, this is, if we did such good, if I did such good with that one piece, imagine what good we could do if we wrote uh, up the whole attitudes of the Founding Fathers. So I then corralled him into the project, and then that led us to uh, writing uh, the book, The Goddess Constitution, and the title of which is not really ours. The, it, the title comes from the founding generation because it was criticized as a godless document, and that's where the title comes from, and that then produced the book. <laughs> you know, Isaac has a <coughs> better memory than I do, but I do know that, that we had been watching 
uh, as scholars and just as private citizens, the increasing mobilization of conservative religious groups under the general rubric evangelical uh, to, you know, try to inject a religious voice into politics. And this was Pat Robertson, Jerry Falwell, right. thinking back. Ralph and Lee. we were certainly trying to say something about why that was. It's not, you know, it, you can't say this is unconstitutional, but it, it is certainly something that was against the spirit of the kind of government we, we had set up, which was secular. And we knew as a historian that this has been <laughs> violated a lot uh, over the course of American history. It, it wasn't the first time that uh, religious leaders were trying to mold some type of religious energy into a conservative, almost, well, it was not always a conservative political agenda. It could be a, a more progressive political agenda, but we were just saying that stop. And um, so we wrote the book. So as a historian, do you want to talk briefly about why the founders left God out of our U.S. Constitution? Well, it was intentional. You know, it wasn't an accident. They didn't forget about it. Yeah, they it. didn't forget. Uh, <laughs> a slight oversight. Uh, but no, they, they were, you know, I mean, the long historical view was that, you know, Europe, which we were trying to, you know. Get away from. Get away from, had been fighting for centuries, wars over religion. And it had been constantly trying to define the boundary between the, the ruling kings or queens at the time and clerics who were very powerful. And, you know, something like this was behind the Protestant Reformation. But that didn't stop it because Reformation leaders were just as involved in trying to control um, things uh, in the secular sphere as were, you know, so anyway. so. The point was that enough of that. So let's set up a government that does not, you know, it's not against religion. It's just Neutral. declaring that religion is something that is private. It's not part of public life. And they had inspiration from a very famous religious leader of out of colonial America whose name everyone ought to know, Roger Williams, who was involved in the founding of Rhode Island. Now, Roger Williams, um I just wanted to point out that it, the document is very much of its time. Not only is it the negative omission of God, but there is the positive issue in Article 6 of the Constitution in which the founders insist that there be no religious test for public office. And that was an, a response to an immediate issue, which is that they had all virtually all come from Britain, uh, which had religious tests until the uh, early, uh, third decade of the 19th century. So that in, 1770, in 1787, when the document is written, if, if you were a Unitarian or a Quaker in Britain, you could not go to Oxford or Cambridge. And these were called the Tests and Corporation Acts. And they very much wanted to prevent that in the, United, in the new nation. So Article 6 says no religious tests shall be applied. And that was a lightning rod in the state ratifying conventions because virtually all the colonies had religious uh, clauses restricting uh, public office. Uh, and we can talk about this in a, in a little while, that in fact some of them still exist. Uh, so it, 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 they knew what they were doing. It, 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 yes, it was deliberate and intentional. Uh, it, was a, it was a break that is not just from England, but from the colonies and from the newly formed state governments. So I think you've used the phrase in your books that they invented religious liberty. So Larry, you want to speak to that? Well, the invention of religious liberty is, I don't know, I mean, it, it comes by degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you were know, mentioning Roger Williams. Uh, yeah, Roger Williams, uh, who is very, you know, he, in my opinion, had it right. He was an incredibly pious Calvinist, which led him to a strict notion that the things of God and the things of the flesh are separate. And he was very specific that when it comes to whoever leads the state, an atheist can lead the state as well as uh, a man of God, maybe even better. And so, but that didn't mean he was trying to demean religion, quite the contrary, because it was, it was partly for the health of religion that he wanted government 
to stay out of it. He didn't want government in his involved with his churches. And in fact, he kind of coined the phrase that Jefferson modified about that Jefferson that turned into the Jeffersonian phrase, the wall of separation between wall church and separation state. Wall of separation, which is not in the Constitution, of course. But it explains it, the establishment it was his, clause. It was his. I think it's it's fair to say of what he was trying to uh, create something that didn't exist. Uh, and he had fought for it before the Constitution in the state of Virginia, along with James Madison. So the quotation of Jefferson that I always like to give my students about church and state is, is not the letter f to the ba Baptists of, uh, of Connecticut in 1804, but from his only one, the one book that he ever wrote, which is the Notes on Virginia. When he talks about religion in Virginia, he says uh, the, the legitimate power of government extends only to acts which are injurious to others. If my neighbor says there is no God or there are 20 gods, it does not injure me. It neither b breaks my leg or steals my purse, which is a wonderful homey way of saying whatever people think about re God or religion doesn't in any way hurt me. Uh, and the only purpose of government, and this he is taking from the great philosopher John Locke, the only purpose of government is to protect you as an individual from being hurt by someone else. And views about the deity have no impact on your purse or your body. <laughs> now we've been talking about your first book, your first collaboration, The Godless Constitution. Um, in the next segment we're going to talk about godless, godless citizens, but I thought it was very touching that both of you dedicated that book to your grandchildren in the hopes that they can choose whether to have one God, 20 gods, or no gods at all. So you're quoting that Thomas Jefferson. I thought that was a very touching way to start the book. Um, so uh, we are talking with Larry Moore, Isaac Kramnick, co-authors of The Godless Constitution and Godless Citizens. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the fact that we can't have a religious test for public office, but we seem to have a religious test for good citizenship. And your book really champions the rights of free thinkers to religious liberty in the United States. We'll be back in a minute with more Free Thought Matters. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist, and I'm alarmed by the intrusions of religion into our secular government. That's why I'm asking you to support the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics, working to keep state and church separate, just like our founding fathers intended. Please support the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. My name's Jarvis, and I'm an out-of-the-closet atheist. There are many reasons why I'm an atheist, but I'll start with the crudest explanation. I'm sure many of you have seen Clash of the Titans or The Immortals or 300, these blockbuster films about ancient Greek or Roman religion, which we now call mythology. But back then it wasn't mythology. It was very real for them. They genuinely believed that you had to put a coin in a person's mouth before they were buried so that they could pay for the literal ferry to the afterlife. Just as many people today believe that they should eat crackers and wine on a Sunday or that God wants women to hide their bodies under black burqas. Every religion that has ever existed, and there are many, have all believed that they were right, that their rituals and rules and beliefs were 100% correct. And they all thought they nailed it. But where are they today? Uh, if they're not completely forgotten, they're on the silver screen, amusing us with their sword fights, animal sacrifices, and oracles. The religions of today are the entertainment of tomorrow. Everyone, I hope, is an atheist about Zeus and Apollo, Juno and Poseidon. I just added Jesus and Muhammad to that list. Thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. You can find more content by the Freedom From Religion Foundation at our website, ffrf.org. Follow FFRF on Facebook and you'll get notifications about all of our content, including whenever we go live on FFRF's Ask an Atheist. FFRF is also on YouTube, where all of our programs, including this show and our weekly news bites, are available to watch anytime. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you on the web.
Welcome back to Free Thought Matters. I'm here with historians, authors Larry Moore and Isaac Kramnik. Uh, they have written The Godless Constitution, and their newest book is The Godless Citizens in a Godly Republic. They recently addressed the National Convention of the Freedom from Religion Foundation, and we have some short clips from their talk. The so-called nuns equals easily the number of people who claim to be conservative evangelicals. I wrote down 23 percent of the population, though Annie Laurie told me this morning that the Pew Foundation says 26 percent of the population are now nuns, so the Freedom From Religion Foundation is doing something right. Um, even so, evangelicals make cowards out of politicians of both parties. Even the non-believing ones don't like to talk about religion and say, yes, God blesses this country. Obama said that. God bless our country. And that's because around 50% of the people in both political parties say they would not vote for a well-qualified person who did not believe in God. This problem is older than you think. Um, uh, that's where the historian in me kicks in. The late iconoclastic comedian Robin Williams like millions of non-believers and like many in this room, remains unpersuade, remained unpersuaded about America's dependence on divine guidance. If he could, he would tell audiences repeatedly, he would yet again rewrite the Pledge of Allegiance, this time with less attention to religion and more to geography. And so he would often, in his appearances, offer a new pledge of allegiance, and I quote it. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under Canada and above Mexico, <laughs> inadmiss <laughs> indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <laughs> so, Larry, can you tell me what, is the, what prompted you both to write the follow-up book Godless citizens in a godly republic. Well, there are a couple of things. I mean, you know, getting on to 20 years since the publication of the first book, we hadn't changed the world. <laughs> <laughs> Though I will say that the phrase "the godless constitution" is we see it often in we editorials. Used it. We used it. I mean, it, in your it, it, it is. I mean, both as an attack phrase and as an endorsement. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, and so right. that's good to see. But on the other hand, we still have the same issue of... But I was working in my own head on a different matter, which is the question of the ways in which our customs and our laws discriminate between people who are believers and non-believers, because this is a different kind of constitutional problem. And I was working on the idea of the notion of a religious exemption from generally applicable laws. Which is a big deal, right? Yeah, now. and you can either see that as it was originally intended as a specific legislative act to exempt Quakers, for example, in colonial America from fighting or having to bear arms in colonial. And that, that's not a constitutional right, but it was a legislative exemption. But then, more recently, it's become a, 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 a constitutional question that, you know, that this is a right. And... Um, <laughs> And, and I think what really, you know, was the final, to me, was the Hobby Lobby case in which the idea of a religious exemption was granted in, in some kind of really blanket terms. And this is, this is the um, cake baker who didn't no, have... No, this is the case of the... Um, the I'm sorry, Hobby the Lobby. Hobby, yes. Hobby Lobby, the employees who wanted an exemption from the uh, uh, Obamacare laws because they thought that some of the money might be used to fund abortions. So there's or nothing in the law that's saying that yeah. it will be or can be or often is. We're talking what, about Obamacare and the contraceptive mandate yes. and women's birth control being yeah. covered by yeah. insurance. And, and so these two, there were two companies involved and they were, they said, okay, you don't have to do it, even though it was not infringing on, as far as I could understand the term, anything they did with respect to religious practice. So you so, took alarm at that. So I told Isaac that I thought we should do something with this and write another book, and, and Isaac said, well, okay, but we should make it more broad, just a, a question of the whole history and philosophy of, of, of um, you know, 
the growth of atheism and agnosticism in so this country. Your book says if the First Amendment protects religious liberty, why doesn't it protect atheists? And that was another thing, that how is atheism or agnosticism, it was ignored, I think, in most, you know, of the, even among the, our founders, or certainly among John Locke, uh, who was considered one of the English um, authors of religious liberty. When they thought about religious liberty, they weren't thinking of non-believers. No. Because, well, one, there were very few of them. It was a different time. There weren't 26% of the population who were non-believers. Uh, so they, they, it didn't occur to them. They were thinking about different religious groups and how to treat all of those religious groups fairly. Uh, and atheism was just put outside uh, the fold. Now, what we are arguing is that, you know, free thinking is a form of religious opinion. An expression. An expression. It's not Freedom hostile to anybody else. It's not that, um, you know, I want to be better than a Presbyterian. I just want to be normal like a Presbyterian and in and, and our cultural sense that, you know, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing disqualifying about being a uh, non-believer if you want to run for president. And then, and then the, the, the nuance that I, I added when Larry approached me, uh, this was, of course, a reverse of our first book in which I approached Larry. Larry approached me and if I were interested in participating in the project. It reflects that I am a professor of politics and he is a professor of history. And I was said, what, what, why don't we look at the politics of atheism, uh, especially uh, the contemporary politics of atheism as a social movement, the groups, uh, the groups that are involving, uh, that are involved in uh, atheist awareness and atheist issues and. So that then gave a, diff a slightly d a different but additional uh, texture to the book uh, in which we look at both at the historic intellectual history issues, legal issues, but also in the contemporary movement uh, of atheism, which is a, a classic social movement, uh, much like the uh, Civil rights movement, the gay rights movement, uh, and 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 now the free thinking movement as it participates in American politics. And of course, we're very honored to have the Freedom from Religion Foundation noted duly in your yes, book. Yes, well, it should be. <laughs> it absolutely, because it is, be. it is the leading organization at the moment and the one that generates the most uh, enthusiasm. Well, that makes me very proud. <laughs> well, you should be. And I, I only want to say that through all of the work that. Um, that we are not one of those authors who is who are out to um, reject all religion. You know, our freedom from religion is freedom from a particular kind of religion, um, which is very well represented in our contemporary culture. But I have no problem with you know people who choose to be uh, a believer. Yeah, you wrote this as scholars, yeah. you're examining it. Um, but I do, do think that my favorite chapter is the chapter called Atheist Awakening. Yes. And you're taking note of it, the, the huge growth in seculars. At the same time, there's such pushback against us and against uh, our godless constitution. And as I say, non-believers ought to speak out. Uh, they ought to be mad. They ought not to be indifferent to the kinds of things that our courts allow that uh, God and the Pledge of Allegiance, the money we carry in our pockets. These are not just, th these help define a culture, which, not a, not a legal culture, but a culture which is hostile to non-belief. You can run for president uh, now, I think, without being disqualified on legal or constitutional grounds because you don't believe in God. But in fact, Culturally, you are disqualified. Still, yes. Still, with 26 percent of the population, in eight nuns. states and eight, eight state constitutions, which still say you have to believe in God in, in order to hold public office. But what's fascinating to both of us as historians, as uh, I as a historian of politics, is why the this atheist awakening 
which is really now two decades, really since 2000. What, what, what's behind it? Why is it now? Uh, just as people, scholars have been very, have gone back and forth about why did the civil rights movement after a hundred years of at the end of the Civil War, why did it come in the 1960s? Similarly, why did the atheist awakening come after, by and large, after the year 2000, although your organization is from the 1970s, but your real presence in America, in, 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 in the American consciousness is in, in the last 20 years. And it's an interesting question. We are for going to have to say people are going to have to read your book to get the answer to that question. Okay. But I do love the way you end that book, and that is that our human progress and survival depends on the application of science and humanistic principles. So thank you so much for everything you've done to enlighten the world and to champion the rights of minorities, including atheists and agnostics in our country, and educating about the fact that we have a godless and secular constitution. And thank you for watching Free Thought Matters because free thought matters. Hi, I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.